state that both electromagnetic interaction and strong interaction, they are mediated by massless particles. So there is no finite change, they are infinite in process because range will be inverse of mass, so there is this infinite in process. What about the pion exchange force between proton and neutron? Okay? This is not a basic force, this is a residual force. Like the hydrogen force between two neutral atoms. When two neutral atoms come very close, so that the interatomic distance is comparable to interatomic distance, then the attractive force between unlike charges and the repulsive force between like charges do not exactly cancel. So there is a short range residual force left which is responsible for binding atoms in a molecule. Okay? Similarly, <coughs> similarly, when the when the uh, uh, proton and neutron which are three quarts, three quarts, when they come very close together so that the distance between them is of the order of Fermi, which is size of the photo, then the repulsive force and attractive force do not exactly cancel. There is a residual soft range force left, which is this stru the, the, the strong nuclear force, okay? Okay? which binds proton and neutron in, 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 in nuclei. The nuclei are analogous. So the protons are quark atoms, neutrons are quark atoms, nuclei are analogous to the, to the molecules. So this force is analog of the ventral. But there is one basic force which is a short range force that is the weak interaction. <coughs> Let me introduce this along with two other related entities, weak isospin and neutrinos. I told you the proton and neutron are made up of quarks. But there are two kinds of quarks, up quark and down quark. Up quark ch carry charge two thirds in electronic charge units, down quark carries charge minus one. Okay? The neutron is made up of one up quark and two down quark, so the charge is zero. Proton is made of two up quark, four third charge, one down quark, minus one third, so charge is plus one. Okay? Now again you see, the charge difference is one unique in this case, just like proton and neutron. So that suggests that this pair is an isospin doublet carrying isospin projection plus up and minus up and this one unique difference in the isospin projection is showing up as the charge difference. Except that this is not nuclear isospin, this is weak isospin. This is responsible for weak interaction, this acts as the charge for weak interaction. <coughs> Just like electric charge, charge responsible for electric interaction, color charge responsible for strong interaction, this isospin is responsible for Finally, Electron itself is accompanied by an isospin pa pa partner called neutrino, which carries zero electric charge. This is minus one electric charge. Again, this is the charge difference one eight, which reflects the fact that this has isospin projection plus up. This is isospin <coughs> minus one. Together, they constitute one isospin. Okay. The most common form of weak interaction is neutron beta decay. Neutron decays into proton emitting an electron and anti-neutrino. The basic process is one of the d quarks of the neutron goes into an off quark emitting an electron and, and an, an anti-neutrino. Okay, so this is illustrated here. Okay, down quark going to off quark emitting electron and And this force, this interaction is called weak interaction. And this is mediated by a massive boson called W boson. This is a charge boson because, because D is going to use, so they, it has charge 1 is very emitted, so this is charge W boson which, which mediates the weak interaction. Clear? Any, any questions so far? Now, the mass of this particle is huge. It has a mass of 80 GeV, 80 times as much as possible. Accordingly, the range is S cross C over MW, S cross C we saw was 0.2 GeV, that means one fifth of a GeV times per bit. Again, divided by 80 will be 1 over 400. Okay. It is because of the short range of this force that the weak interaction is so weak. Okay. 
Okay, we are almost there. Except that in nature there are three pairs of quarks and three pairs of neutrons. Okay? So the basic constituents of matter are a dozen of particles. They are spin half particles, that's why they are called fermions, they are called metal fermions. They constitute three pairs of electrons, electron, mu, tau, along with their associated neutrinos, and three pairs of quarks of down, strain, charm, bottom, and top. They are arranged here in increasing order of mass shown in ray in GV units. Mass of the charged leptons go up from 0.5 mg for electron to 1.8 GV for tau spanning 3 orders of magnitude. Likewise, the mass of constituent quarks go up from 0.3 GV for up and down to 175 J for tau, again spanning 3 orders of magnitude. In this scale, the neutrinos are practically massless. In fact, till about 15 years back, neutrinos were absolutely massless, mass but we now know that neutrinos have a tiny but non-zero mass. That will be the topic of my lecture this afternoon. Okay? So how tiny it is? It is about few trillionth of a GeV. So for now, we can treat them as a zero mass. Okay? Again, the charge we saw was zero for the neutrino and minus 1 for the, for the, for the um, charge electrons against the mass charge difference is 1 unit is 2 third for the upper quarks minus 1 third for the lower one again the charge difference is 1 unit and as we saw the charge difference of 1 unit reflects the fact that each pair carries isospin half so pro isospin projection is plus half and minus half and that isospin projection difference of 1 unit shows up a charge and this isospin is responsible for weak interaction. Okay? So the neutrino carry only isospin half, do not carry any electric charge, so they take part only in weak interaction, no electromagnetic interaction. The charged leptons in addition carry electric charge, so they take part in both weak and electromagnetic interaction. And quartz carry isospin half, charge two third minus one third, and a new kind of charge called color charge, which is responsible for strong interaction. So this takes part in all the three interactions. Okay? <coughs> and the carrier of the basic interactions are vector bosons that they carry spin one. The gluon which carries strong interaction is massless, photon carrying electron is also massless. But the charged W boson and the neutral Z boson which carry weak interaction, they are massive, they are 80 to 90 times as massive. So these are called gauge bosons. I shall discuss gauge theory in my next lecture. But for the time being, let us see where the, these particles are. We have completed all the basic constituents of matter and the carrier of the basic interaction along with their mass and free. So let us look where they are. The lightest quarks up and down constitute proton and neutron. Together with the lightest Lepton, electron, they constitute all the visible matter of the universe. Invisible matter is a different story. In fact, presumably Amitabha Zatto will deal with that. The, the standard model of particle physics has no kind of But all the visible matter of the universe is made up of this lightest quarks and anterior. The heavier quarks and leptons, they decay by weak interaction just like the proton decay we have seen. So they do not occur because they decay by weak interaction, they are unstable, they do not occur freely in nature, just like the trans uranium elements do not occur freely in nature. But they can be observed in accelerators or cosmic ray experiments. The first cosmic ray identification was muon was made in the mid 40s. It was seen in late 30s, but it was confused with the pi measure. The correct identification of muon was made. So was the stress quark in form of K measure. Okay. The neutrinos are stable, but they are very hard to observe because they have only weak interaction matter. New E was observed in atomic reactor experiment in mid 50s. 
Liu Miu was observed in Brookhaven National Lab, proton singleton in 1962. The first cosmical observation of neutrino, Liu Miu, was made in the Kolar Gold Goldfield three years later in 1960. The rest have all been discovered in the last 50 years thanks to the advent of the colliders. First came the electron position collider in the 70s, leading to a windfall of discoveries, charm quark in 74, tau electron in 75, bottom quark in 77, and gluon is 1979. Like William Orsar has said, bleach what is to be alive in that dawn and to be young was the very event. I happened to be young at that, in that dawn. <laughs> so one was discovering a new particle every other, other year. Okay. Then came the Pivot Collider, the Sun Collider discovering W and J fusion in the mid 80s, the Fermilla Core Collider discovering top part in the mid 90s, and finally the new tower was discovered are the fixed target experiment in okay. So as you see, the colliders have been the main workhorse of particle physics over the last 50 years and they are likely to remain so into the next 50 years. So let us describe briefly what these colliders are. Before that, let me spend one slide on what is called a fixed target the synchrotron machine consists of a circular vacuum pipe surrounded by a set of bending magnets shown in red and accelerating RF cavities in between shown in yellow here. The particular beam at a relatively low energy is injected into this vacuum pipe and throughout the course of acceleration as the energy is increasing, velocity is increasing, the Lorentz force on the particle, E times magnetic field times velocity, is balanced by the centrifugal force. So E B is to balanced by M V over R. So as the velocity is increasing, the magnetic field is synchronized to increase simultaneously so that the radius remains constant. You see the enormous advantage synchrotron achieves over a cyclotron. In the cyclotron machine, the Magnetic field is constant, so R the particle is getting as accelerated, V is increasing, R should increase, so it spirals up, upwards, upwards, upwards. So the entire circle, any of the circle, you have to cover with magnet from top and bottom. Okay? That limits the maximum energy can go. The present the machines have radius of something like 5 kilometer, 10 kilometer. So that entire area you cannot cover with magnet, it will be prohibitively expensive. Okay? But because of this technology, you can cover only the circumference of the circle with magnet, so you can increase the radius of the machine and both higher energy. Here. The next technological development was in going from a fixed target machine to a collider. You see, collider is a singleton machine where the particular beam and antiparticle beam, being a electron position or a proton, they are accelerated inside the same vacuum pipe using the same set of bending magnets and accelerating cavity we saw in the last slide. Thanks to their equal mass and opposite charge, the particular beam and the antiparticle beam, they go around in same orbit in opposite direction on top of one another throughout the course of acceleration. This is called the acceleration mode, and when the acceleration is complete, they are made to collide head on at the collision points by switching their orbits with a magnetic switch. Now, this is the collision mode. In this mode, the particle beam and the antiparticle beam keep on colliding with one another repeatedly, turn after turn, day after day, month after month. In fact, the collider spends bulk of its running time in the collision mode. Now, one covers or one surrounds the collision point with a detector like CMS of which Arun is a part. The detectors 
dictates what is coming out of this world. Okay? The advantage of a collider over a fixed target accelerator is an enormous gain in the low range invariant energy because low range invariant energy is the only physically meaningful dependence of energy because it does not depend on the frame of the observer. Okay? And you know that low range invariant energy is same as the center of mass moment, center of movement. You see, a collider, let us see how big is the energy. A collider, <coughs> the lap frame is same as the center of momentum frame. So, so center of ma momentum energy is simply twice en energy because center of momentum is, 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 is because, because net momentum is zero. Okay? So, original energy which net energy square minus net momentum square will be, will be, will be net, 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 net energy, twice, twice the energy. In contrast, if you have a fixed target at rest here, consists of say proton, okay, and the beam has energy prime, then the Lorentz invariant energy will be chopped again. This will be P plus P prime whole square. Okay? So root s will be p times square plus p square plus two p dot p prime. Now p times square p square are the mass squares. Okay, that's the one GV. Too small, forget that. And p dot p prime, the only surviving term will be energy term because momentum of the of the of the target is zero. And the energy energy of the target is less mass energy. So it will be twice target less mass m times will be b energy prime. Okay? Now let us see in a real life experiment. The Hartman Collider at Fermi Lab has beam energy of 1 TeV, that is 1000 J. So, Lorentz invariant energy root S is 2000 J. The equivalent beam energy of the fixed target machine will be from this expression S over twice M, which is proton target mass. So, it will be <coughs> root S is 2000, so it is 2000 J square over twice in proton mass 1 gb, so it is 2 million. <coughs> so energy gain is factor of 2 thousand higher, not factor of 2 higher. Okay? Okay? Because the only physically meaningful definition of energy is the energy. And for an electron position collider, the energy gain will be another factor of 2 thousand higher because the electron mass in the denominator is 2 thousand times lower than proton mass. Okay? So that shows you the enormous techn technical advantage which a collider brings over a fixed target machine at practically no extra cost. The same short synchrotron has been converted into a collider. 